March of the Machine, Episode 9, The Old Sins of New Phyrexia Centuries ago, the angels staved off the oil of unlife on New Capenna. For centuries, the people of New Capenna have been safe from the encroachment of the enemy. They lent this knowledge of the enemy to their sisters on other planes. Thus, the multiverse remained vigilant about the coming threat. It was good. It is no longer enough. Their safeguards have failed. Now the multiverse cries out for help. Another angel, corrupted and dark, has come to New Capenna to reap the rewards sown by its people's sin. She cuts her way through the city's defenses as a farmer threshing wheat. Buildings that stood for generations collapsed in moments. Glass and blood line the gutters. War machines rumble through the streets that once bustled with cars. Stone springs to life. Angels that have waited centuries to serve again hear the clarion call to battle. What have they waited for, if not this? Radiant weapons slice through the hulls of towering monstrosities. Wings shield those fleeing from the porcelain onslaught of the enemy. For hours they lend their strength. Those shattered by Phyrexian weaponry dematerialize at the last, as Halo. That glimmering angelic essence they may still serve. But Phyrexia's armies are teeming 10,000, and there are far fewer angels on New Capenna than there once were. Fortunate that they are not its only protectors. Where angels beat back the enemy and shield the Capenna forces, there are demons and devils to take the offensive. Here a seraph infuses a tower with Halo, there a demon severs the head of those climbing it. Few things are more repugnant than demons, and there will be a price for all this later, but it is a price the angels of New Capenna are willing to pay if it keeps their charges safe. The youngest among those angels, Giada, wants to help, but she's too small to join in the melee, too newly formed for the battlefront. All she can do is watch from the towers and shout to the others where they're most needed. Despite this, she can't help but feel there's something she's missing. She's certain she'll know it when she sees it. Angels are all about certainty, her older siblings told her. Deeper into the city goes Atraxa, her army in her wake. The intricate workings of Park Heights do not impede the swing of her scythe. Riveteers slicked with sweat hide in whatever rafters they can find. Their quick hands disassemble the work of their forefathers. Tools used to forge connections are now used to sever them violently in gouts of flame. The corrupted angel does not see them at this work. They are too small, too many, too disparate. They are beneath her notice. In the end, that is her undoing. An explosion rips through the structures of the city. Deep within the structure of the Mezio as she is, she does not notice that it's begun to topple until it's already too late. In the end, it is not the shield of the angels that kills her, nor the machinations of the demons. It is the city itself. The gleaming glass and steel tower of New Capenna collapses atop her, cut free from its mighty pylons and suspension systems. From their perch, the angels watch centuries of mortal work crash into the earth. Giada's essence fizzes with excitement, but it isn't yet right for her to intervene. There's someone she's waiting to hear from. The others waste no time. The defenses of New Capenna must not be confined to the city alone. If the multiverse is to survive, the angels must watch over it and fight against Phyrexia with all they have. Atraxa's death has changed New Phyrexia, and the invasion tree is changing with it. The angels feel it as the mortals might feel the earth trembling beneath their feet. The barbs are retracting back to their home, leaving the pathway open for attack. Their view of New Phyrexia beyond the portal changes to a view of somewhere else. 
a place with a wine-dark sea, a place where the sky shimmers with the belief of its people. And though there are no angels on Theros, they can't deny that it's desperately in need of help. To do the just thing without regard for your own safety, to see beyond the needs of the few, this is what it means to guard the multiverse. Giada grins. This is the start of things. The start of what she's been waiting for. She hurriedly shouts at the others, This is where we're needed! This is where we've got to go! Help them out if you can! Angels soar through the air, hurtling at unimaginable speed toward the portal. On the other side, they burst high above the sea. The angels displaced in this way feel no fear, no hesitation, no regret. They simply do as they've always done. They protect. Like motes of dust, they travel the winds towards their destination. Some wrap about the throat of a thrashing sea monster, holding it in place long enough for a crew of sailors to sever its heads. Others make their way to temples. The gods who call it home matter not. The supplicants in need of protection soon find it. The black oil smeared across a fleeing woman's arm miraculously avoids her wounds. A javelin thrower turns the second before he would have found himself skewered. There is one god who notices their arrival. Bright as the morning sun, the befouled Heliod shines. The ethereal angels threatening to burn within his sight. Yet they venture closer and closer and closer. For clambering up behind him is a woman who needs help as much as she hates asking for it. So distracted is the god that he does not notice Kaya's violet-wreathed form upon his corrupted carapace, when at last she drives a dagger into his throat. Well, the angels see to it that the spray of black oil never touches her. As the god fades, the woman lands once more on the temple. Ajani is there to meet her, but what does a god killer have to fear from a mere mortal? Giada's formless heart beats faster. Every step is a step closer to her old friend. Once more the portals of New Capenna shift, this time to myriad planes, some new to the angels, some familiar, all in the desperate throes of a fight they cannot win alone. Good thing they are no longer alone. Charge! Giada shouts. War horns echo throughout New Capenna, and the angels spread where they are needed most. On planes where they are worshipped, on planes where they are hated, on planes where they are completely unknown, they do what they have always done. When at last the portals turn to New Phyrexia, Giada knows precisely what to do. The moment has finally arrived. There, in plain view, is Elspeth Terrell. I'm so happy to see you, she calls. Elspeth Terrell is too busy to do more than glance towards the portal. There are thousands of Phyrexians charging the platform before her. Fighting takes most of her attention. Even so, when her gaze skims towards the surface, there's a small smile on her lips. Giada, I'm happy to see you too. She's already learned to speak the proper way, hasn't she? It warms Giada's spirit to see Elspeth shining so brightly. You've done so well. Thank you, Elspeth answers. She drives her sword through a winged blade serpent, splitting it down the center. But there's still work to be done. That's just what I wanted to tell you. Some of us are coming to help. The serpent falls to the ground, but Elspeth remains in flight. A copper vine wraps around her sword arm. She severs it with a weighty chop. Whatever aid you can send, I'll accept gladly. Giada remembers what it is like to grin. Though she cannot in this form, she feels it in her spirit. She readies another call. Those who go to New Phyrexia will not return. It is a small price to pay. Someone must watch over them. Someone must staunch the bleeding. Charge! On Dominaria, it was often said that the Zulfirans did not know fear. But the Zulfirans said otherwise. So far as they were concerned, 
They knew fear better than anyone else. You could find fear sitting by the fires near nightfall. Every parent who sent a child to war chatted with fear in the mornings and at night. Fear was with you when you surveyed your fields and wondered if there'd be enough for the coming season. The truth of the matter is, when you know fear and invite fear into your house, when you treat fear as you'd treat anyone else, fear can no longer frighten you. Your community will look after your fears, and you will look after theirs. The multiverse is afraid of new Phyrexia. Very well. Let Zelfir look after that. Armed to the teeth, smiling and eager as they face the enemy, the war clans are only too happy to meet the Phyrexians. As Koth's barricade comes tumbling down, the Zulfirans charge ahead. Teferi catches Koth, staring down at them with confusion. Wait, where do you come from? What's going on? Teferi smiles at him. Pride swells in his chest. Zulfir! Ren found us! We're here to help! All around them, the ceiling is starting to crumble. The ground is a tremble. Teferi isn't bothered. The two planes are swapping places! New Phyrexia is being flung out into the abyss, and Zulfir is... finally coming home. She will welcome you into yours, if you let her. Koth looks out to the gathered forces. His expression is hard to read. Determination, relief, and sorrow all carve their marks upon his iron. Then let us make sure Phyrexia never forgets us. Murans, make your marks! There aren't many Murans left, but those who can fight are only too happy to join the charge. A veil of multicolored light settles over the army's vibrant garments like the blessing of a distant god. Power prickles along their skin. They know what danger the black oil presents them. They know how to counter it. Lances pierce Phyrexian serpents and nail them to the platform's surface. Hurled stones crush them underfoot. Rains of fire melt the enemy in place. Breath of ice makes them brittle. The blow of a great hammer shatters them into hundreds of pieces. For years, Zulfir awaited the chance to prove their mettle against these Argent slags. Now they are in the thick of the fight, and there is a prideful joy in the air. Siddars start their chants, calls and responses echoing from the mouths of the Askari, Akinji, and the Alatli. You cannot break! What is woven together? Bravado is as potent as any armor. After only minutes on the field, the Zulfirans drive a wedge into the Phyrexian army's forces, while their healers tend to the wounded Morans on the platform. At the vanguard rides Teferi, his staff aglow, magic swirling around him. The spears that fly, the bladed insects that swarm, the shards of the dead blown asunder, all slow as they near him. His companions snatch weapons from the air and hurl them back at their owners. And though Teferi may rarely know exertion such as this, he meets it with a glad heart and centuries of skill. Rushing to catch up with him are the other Morans, those that can still fight. Chandra points him out to Koth. You see? That's him! That's Teferi! I told you he was- She's cut off when Praetor Vornklex leaps towards Teferi's vanguard. A moment of hesitation stops Chandra's breath, but Vornklex does not get far before he hits the wall of Teferi's magic. Everyone, no matter how fearsome, looks foolish moving in slow motion. Even Koth breaks into a smile at the sight. Alright, maybe you were on to something. But he too is busy. Koth drives both fists into the ground. Two cracks spread out towards the Zulfirans, one on each side. Give me a hand. Chandra doesn't know exactly what he wants, but she assumes he needs fire. She sends some shooting down each of the cracks. Flames rise to fend off the incoming blows of the Phyrexian army, and turn the Ascari's burning weaponry into bladed infernos. Only a few seconds later, after Koth whips his arms up, incandescent metal shards fall like the condemnation of the multiverse 
on the backs of the Phyrexian army. Yet not all meet their fate so easily. Even Teferi's concentration can flicker. Vornklex's struggle against it at last finds purchase. He tears the jaws from Teferi's mount and sends him tumbling to the ground. In no time at all, the Praetor is atop his prey. Vorinclex's roar has heralded the death of many warriors, but fear is an old friend of Teferi's, and he does not feel its pull now. Look behind you! The Praetor turns, snarling. A blazing sword severs Vorinclex's head from his body. One of the Ascari, a woman named Shella, who often drank her comrades under the table, offers Teferi a hand up. He takes it, thanks her, and then she is gone. On a battlefield, there is always more work to be done. It's then he sees the angel, hovering only a little overhead. The serenity of her expression belies the concern in her eyes. You need to be more careful. Elspeth? He asks. But the confusion on his face changes to acceptance, as he offers her a smile in the middle of the battlefield. I'm happy you're here. There's something foreign in the way she looks back at him, as if she doesn't entirely understand how it is she's meant to respond. In the end, she doesn't. Teferi understands. Sometimes people change. She's still his friend and a skilled soldier. Any tactical advice? A copper root flies toward Elspeth. She severs it with a single cut. She doesn't spare Teferi a glance. Leave Nissa to me. Your forces will need to hold off Jingataxis and Norn. My sisters have given us a gift. The infection cannot take hold so long as they are with us. Don't waste it. Elspeth speaks in a strikingly normal voice, as if she's discussing what to wear at an outing, rather than the plans vital to the survival of life on all planes. Understood, he says, but by then she's already left. Up above them, the roof of the sanctum cracks. Ren's work, Teferi wagers. As Zulfir moves to take New Phyrexia's place in the multiverse, New Phyrexia is cracking under the pressure. Structures tear and break. Slabs of metal plummet down. Zulfiran wizards conjure up the winds to redirect the boulders out toward the enemy. No amount of Phyrexian armor can protect against the forces of mass and gravity. Smears of black oil are all that remain of those squashed beneath. Distant towers topple, monuments shatter, vats crack and oil slicks the walkway. The ground rumbles beneath Teferi's feet. These are the death throes of Phyrexia. And there is its keening death wail. Flinging aside soldiers with ease, consigning them to the abyss, is Elish Norn. Her porcelain armor is pitted in places and outright sundered in others, revealing her weak, torn sinew beneath. Towering over the army, even the war machines, she strikes Teferi as a lion with a sour wound. What we've done, what I've built, will last forever! She screams. Phyrexia will never die! You're only delaying the inevitable! Why can't you understand that? Why can't you accept your fates? Teferi sends word through the ranks to focus fire on the giant praetor. A volley of magic, lightning, ice, fire, bolts of verdant energy, withering dark, beat her back. Norn staggers, swaying on her feet. Norn's oil-slicked mouth hangs open in shock. She clutches a talon to the cluster of wounds on her chest. When she surveys the army once more, she lets out another scream. Why aren't any of you protecting me? I am Phyrexia! The army hears her, and the army stops, but only long enough for their own general to speak up. Jingataxis rides atop a massive war machine. Long and narrow, it is bedecked with all manner of weaponry. Bladed spikes, a great ram at its head, 
All this to protect its precious cargo, a vat filled with his own progeny. Writhing newt-like creatures, nearly ready to be born, press their featureless faces against the glass. When he speaks, the vat flickers with light. Your ego is a tumor on whatever talent you may have had. New Phyrexia has evolved beyond you, but your scraps may still serve some use. To see them turn against one another, both surprises and relieves to Fairy, as does the familiar boom of a planeswalker's arrival, until he sees a Johnny, badly wounded, joining the fray. You, Jingataxia sneers, out of the way, that thing behind you is Phyrexia's true enemy. No, a Johnny booms, Phyrexia stands united, or not at all. Teferi had no time to decide what to do before Jingataxis' legions descend on Norn and Ajani. Centurions hack at her armor, pulling off sheets in chunks as she crushes however many of them she can. It is as if she is being assailed by a massive swarm of beetles, all of whom have sharp teeth and sharper weapons. Ajani rips and slashes at them, First with his axe, and then, when it's torn from his grasp, with his claws and teeth. He cannot stop them all. Let them weaken, Norn. Ajani leaps in front of her, only to catch a disorienting blast of magic that leaves him on his back. Ropes and nets are cast over him, and Zulfurin warriors surge forward with spears. On an instinct he can't name, Teferi shouts, Wait! Take that one alive! A Johnny thrashes against his bonds, leaking blood and oil into the ropes, until another spell freezes him solid. Obediently, the warriors drag the subdued Leonin out of the fight. In the meantime, Jingataxius has given Norn so much of his attention, he's left himself open. Zulfirins understood the dangers of infighting, as few did. That left them in a unique position to capitalize on the failings of their foes, and to save what they could of their friends. While Jingataxius oversees his army's attack on Elish Norn, Teferi and the vanguard head straight for him. Claws rend through steel and iron, swords and axes cleave skull and sternum. Always the Zulfirin war chants and drums lend them vigor. As Phyrexia dies around them, the Zulfirans are more alive than they've ever been. When the Praetor turns to behold the splendor of their valor, he laughs, for he does not know fear. Is that the best you can muster? Organics? He gestures with his claw. Spikes shoot from the flanks of his war machine, impaling the beasts who strive to break it. Blood spurts onto the glass as the animals howl. Look around, Teferi calls. It seems to me New Phyrexia is the one getting left behind. Jingataxis gestures once more. Blades emerge from the joints of the war machine. Another gesture and they begin to spin. Teferi's heart sinks. Many of their mounts aren't going to make it out of this, but it'll be worth it if the rest can survive. There will be time to mourn their old friends later. Teferi ducks the oncoming swing of a centurion. Blades, tendrils, and barbs, all slow as he weaves his way through the melee towards the war machine. While Zulfir's prowess is legendary, there is something only he can do. Sucking in a breath, he lays a hand on the flat of the spinning blades. For a precious second, they come to a stop. It is enough. You won't hurt Teferi! A woman shouts. Teferi looks up to see her, one of the war clan's very own, a massive war hammer lifted high over her head as she soars towards Jingataxius. When she brings it down upon him, the war machine's glass cracks. Foul-smelling liquid gushes out, bathing Teferi in its filth. New clothing will be a small price to pay to see Jingataxius plummet into his own creation. 
even smaller when his own creations start eating him. Teferi wipes his face clean. He looks back toward the invasion tree. Koth is overseeing the portal. Most of them have already crossed over into Zulfir, but some linger. Koth, Chandra, and Karn all remain. And judging by the jagged edges of the portal, there won't be much time left to return. It's time to call for a retreat. The war clans have done enough here. Teferi signals to the drummers. The vital rhythm beneath their feet shifts to something far more dour. Zulfir knows what this means. For the whole to prosper, the individuals must be kept safe. New Phyrexia is fading, but that doesn't mean the Morans have to fade away along with it. So long as they live, they can forge a new home. Clear a path for the Morans, comes the war leader's shout. Phyrexia does not let them go easily. The Zulfirans at the front fend off what blows they can while the rear of the army retreats through the portal. With every step back they take, they leave scores of dead Phyrexians behind. There are Zulfirans, too, among the dead, but they are treated with reverence. There are those among the army whose sole job it is to see these bodies returned home. Fleet-footed Altali, who weave beneath the tangles of the melee, clad in bright white. The Zulfirans part at the sight of their uniforms to allow them through. By the time Teferi makes it back to the platform, nearly everyone has gone ahead. He can see his home waiting to welcome him on the other side, and he can see Ren, too, jutting from the tree's surface. His old friend has become a delicate ashen statue. Precious little of her bark remains intact. Teferi swallows at the sight. When he looks over the armies once more, the thought is loud in his mind. None of this would have happened without her intervention. There must be something he can do to help. And there, as he studies her, he can see it. An acorn hidden within the ash. It will grow strong as she did on Zulfir. As he carefully plucks it from the ash, Koth shouts from behind him, I'd get to leaving if I were you. Teferi pockets the acorn and turns. He shakes his head. I ran once before my plane was safe. Never again. His eyes fall on his old friend Karn, still alive though torn asunder by Phyrexian experimentation. Teferi lays a hand on Karn's shoulder as he looks to Koth. You go on ahead. But the young man is as stubborn as the metal that dots his skin. He's not going anywhere. And perhaps that's for the best, as a copper spear shoots towards Chandra. It is Koth who raises a shield to protect them. Strange, it isn't like Chandra to let something like that happen. She took whatever excuse she could to melt things. When the shield sinks back to the ground, the picture's clearer. Nissa's on the other side. You ruined everything. You're not yourself, Chandra starts. There isn't time, Koth says. Go back through the portal. No, I'm not leaving without her. She's still in there. I know she is. Nissa hurls another boulder at them, forcing Chandra to blast it away. She steps in front of Koth and opens her arms towards Nissa. If you want to kill me, here I am, but I know you won't. Teferi bites his lip. Chandra's optimism knows no bounds, but it might get her killed here. She'll be alright. It is Karn who speaks from Teferi's side. Elspeth is looking after them. May I ask a favor, Teferi? As if to punctuate the point, a flash of light heralds Elspeth's arrival. A second later, she drives the pommel of her golden sword into the back of Nissa's head. The elf drops like a stone out of her armor and out of the sky. And Chandra, of course, is there to catch her. Of course, old friend. What can I do? Buy me a moment more, Karn says. There's a wobbly tone to his voice, one Teferi hasn't heard before. I want to walk out of this place under my own power. 
Teferi can hardly deny him that. As he watches, Karn forms himself a new body, building it layer by layer. On the horizon, Norn's torn through most of her own army. No longer does she stand tall and proud above the other new Phyrexians, for they have taken her legs. Crawling toward them is a skinless abomination. Even her headpiece has been shattered, yet she still pulls herself forward. Crawling through the fields of dead, she reaches for the portal. We don't have long, says Teferi. No, we don't, agrees Karn. He flexes his new hand, a roughly hewn thing without any of his usual artistry. You should leave. What about you? Karn looks out toward Norn. There is something that needs to be done. Go. Tell the others that we won't be long. Karn feels heavy. This isn't a new feeling. In the most objective sense, as a golem, he's always been heavier than anything around him. In the subjective ones, things haven't often been much better. Since Urza's death, Karn felt heavy every day in one way or another. Some days, the weight of the multiverse paled in comparison to what he felt. And some days, what he feels is the weight of the multiverse. This is one of the later days. Watching Elish Norn crawl toward the platform, he's more aware than ever of the burdens he's chosen to bear. Muradin was his creation. Everything that's befallen it is his fault. What began as simple ignorance of his own composition, bringing glistening oil to Muradin, evolved into a willful ignorance of his failures. For a long time, he'd consigned this place to oblivion. After Venser gave his life to save Karns, the best thing to do seemed to be to live it in atonement. Back then, he thought there must be some way to repair Muradin, some way to undo all his mistakes. He understands differently now. Karn glances at Teferi. The mage is aglow with magic, straining to keep the portal open. After centuries of struggle, Teferi f had finally righted the wrongs of his youth. It's the same for Elspeth. All that time running away from Phyrexia, all that time trying to find a new home elsewhere. And here she'd been only moments ago, resplendent from the righteousness of her new path. You can't run away from your mistakes. You have to fix them. That starts with confronting your wrongs. Karn steps forward. In the dilation of Teferi's time bubble, Norn's screeching is the booming bray of an unseen war horn. What's left of her is pitiable and small. If he leaves now, she may well die from her injuries, but he can't be sure that she will. And if Norn lives, then so does her abomination. Many years ago, Karn vowed never to bring harm to the living. He had seen the horrors of war and wanted no part of them. The first Phyrexian invasion changed that, but those decisions never sat well in his core. What right did he have to end the life of another? He, whose life was so artificial, he hated it. He's always hated it. Whenever possible, he's tried to find other solutions. There are no other solutions to an evil as pernicious as this. To save the lives of many, it must be exterminated completely. How heavy this knowledge is. Karn lays a hand on what remains of Norn's head. To assemble something is a delight, a puzzle that pleases him in a way few things do. The interplay of connected gears and axles is as exquisite to him as any song. Music, he's found, is quite like building a machine. Every piece of an orchestra must function in respect to and in tandem with its fellows. A conductor oversees the process, much as an engineer oversees his creation. In music and in creation, there is unity. In destruction, there can be only solitude. He hates it. As his magic works on Norn's body, 
tearing porcelain from wire, he is filled with an animal revulsion. He wants to look away. He wants to stop. Violence, even in the service of the greater good, should never be easily wrought. He forces himself to look, to watch the metal disintegrate. He burns the sight of Norn's corpse into his memory. He could have asked Teferi. He could have asked Koth. Certainly he could have asked Elspeth. But he is tired of others fixing his problems for him, and asking them to do it would be the same as killing her himself in the end. This is the smallest way he can take responsibility. When it is done, Elish Norn is a red smear against the white platform. Kern walks to the gate. Teferi relents and time resumes. Concern shadows his expression when he sees the carnage. Let's go, Karn says. It is another weight to bear, another heaviness upon him. But it's the first step toward a lighter future. Zalfir welcomes him. March of the Machine, Episode 10, The Rhythms of Life On Kamigawa, a boy returns home, covered in the dust of a city's wreckage. When he arrives, he holds himself differently, no longer afforded the wide-eyed innocence of a child. Things have changed. His mother has changed. The boy's father knows it the moment he hears her voice, the moment he sees her. Gone is her body, replaced by a string of characters that glow in time with false breath, a spirit that hovers before him, holding his son's hand. And yet, it is unmistakably her. A father can wish for many things. A boy can as well. But the one wish that they share is that their family can remain together. Fate has taken much from them, but it has not taken that wish. The father embraces his family, the mother returns home, and the boy stands wary but happy in the middle of it all. On Kaldheim, an elf stands on the gunwale of a commandeered ship. He watches the seas churn before him and he counts the minutes. How long has it been since he's seen his brother? A count of a hundred. A count of two hundred. How long has it been since the serpent dragged him under? Two hundred and fifty. The fighting around them has come to a miraculous halt. Everywhere there is raucous cheering. Everywhere there is music. Everywhere his fellows celebrate a battle hard won. Yet Harald has ears only for the sea. 300. How long will it be until he gives up? How long would it be until Tyvar gave up on him? Harald never has to answer the question. On the count of 313, Tyvar Kell bursts from the water, clinging to the serpent's engorged head. Grinning as always, he slaps its surface. Do you see, brother? You'll never outdo this. Harold does not often cheer when met with a boast he cannot match, but today he will make an exception. On Kaladesh, a mother braces herself for death. What hope does she have for anything else? Her only weapon is a length of sharp metal she scavenged from the wreckage of her plane. Surrounded by Phyrexian soldiers on a platform above the Aetherflux Reservoir, she has nowhere to go. The whir of a metal blade heralds her end, but if she can at least push them off the platform as she falls, maybe it will be safe for a while longer. She takes a breath, takes a step, readies herself for the pain of impact, only for the whirring saw to still. Soldiers crumble like piles of twigs, their metal limbs falling off the platform. Hope blooms in Pia's breast. All over Girapur, it is the same. The Phyrexians are falling. Some stop in place, some crumble apart. Those already completed fall to the ground as if in deep slumber. 
In the distance, their worship is plummeting from the sky. They've won. Peel Nilar's not sure of the mechanics of this. She doesn't know how any of this is happening, although she suspects Sahili will fill her in later. What she does know, and what she has always known, is that she can trust in her daughter to get things done. On that platform above the reservoir, Pia mutters a thanks to Chandra. You can say much with a drum. One rhythm tells the tale of the market's latest wares, another the arrival of a new family member, a third announces the passing of an elder. When you speak in this way, it will carry over a great distance. Another community's drummer may hear it and bring news to their own people, with a flourish to tell them from whence it came. For centuries, the Zalfirans have known this. Whatever they speak with their palms against stretched leather will soon resound through the plain. And on this day, the message is a simple one. Rejoice. Everywhere the drums call. Everywhere rhythm fills the chests of the Zalfirans and tells them of the reason for their joy. Phyrexia lies broken and defeated beyond the reach of time. Zulfir itself has found a new home among the plains, a place where they may once more entertain visitors. Visitors like their own wandering son, Teferi. Teferi too can hear the drums. It is hard not to smile when he does. For him, it's been hundreds of years away, hundreds of years in which he might have forgotten the rhythmic language of home. What a relief to stand on a grassy hill and perfectly understand it. Instead, every beat tells him that he belongs here. And, on other days, he might feel that's true. Most days. Today, the story is complicated. For well, the people of Zulfir are celebrating their victory, Teferi is mourning his losses. It took the better part of two days to find the perfect spot for Ren. As he searched, he tried to imagine what sort of thing she'd like. Would she prefer to grow among the ancient baobab trees, protected by these gigantic arbors? What about Athia? Were they chattier, since there were often so many of them? Did she admire the upright, unfaltering nature of Marula, or was she more interested in the flexible and mystic you? Zulfir had all these and more. Which is the most fitting tribute? for the woman who saved the multiverse. In the middle of the second day, he realized he'd been going about it all the wrong way. The trick wasn't to wonder about the specifics of the thing. With the acorn in hand, he thought of his friend, and he walked until it felt right. So he ended up here on this grassy hill, overlooking town. A few oaks are within singing distance, he thinks, and from here she'll be able to see all manner of things in the village, and when she's grown, she can choose to move wherever she likes. Zulfir will welcome her. Teferi digs. The earth is warm, the soil dark and rich. He lays the acorn in the little clearing he has made, then fills it. Water from his own gourd he offers her. He sits next to the little mound and sighs. I think you'd like this he says. The music, I mean. The mound says nothing. I should join them, you're right. But I wanted to make sure that you were alright first. Down in the village, the flute players have emerged. They, too, begin to dance around the fires. He watches them for a little while. The youths with more vigor than skill, the married couples clinging to one another with an easy grace the Morans who do not know the steps, and the children who teach them. By all accounts, it is a beautiful sight. I've waited a few hundred years. A couple more minutes won't hurt anybody. And I wanted to thank you, again, for everything you've done. It's... He runs a hand along the back of his head. Please don't get the wrong idea. I'm grateful, more grateful than I've ever been. But it's hard to lose another friend. When he searches the faces around the fire, so many of them are familiar. Once, he knew everyone in this village, their mothers, their fathers, who made the best food and whose food is better off, slyly served to their livestock. 
He has lived for years without them, centuries, yet to them he has only been gone a short while. There are bridges that his countrymen can never cross with him, things they can never understand, but family rarely understands each other completely. This place, it is home, and it isn't. It's a home he needs to learn again. They are friends he needs to make again. In the wake of the war against Phyrexia, that feels like an impossible task. Teferi hangs his head back. I know the others are here, he says, and I know... I know I should go speak to them, see how they're doing. Only the drums answer. He closes his eyes. For a long while, he does not open them. Instead, he lays a palm against the earth and wills himself to truly feel it. To notice how it is still a little damp, how it feels when he tugs on the blades, the soft springiness of the dirt beneath. In the distance, he can hear laughter. Probably one of the Morans is asking how to play the flute. Seconds later, a shrill note jolts everyone offbeat, but more laughs follow. The crackle of a fire, the wind against his skin, the cool moonlight air like drinking fresh water. All his wrongs made right. There's a pain pricking at the corners of his eyes, a pressure. For a little while, he will allow himself to weep. Tears for him and his lost years, tears for Karn and his lost past, tears for Nyssa and Johnny and all the others who may never wake now that Phyrexia has fallen. And most of all, there are tears for those who cannot join in the dancing by the fire. When he is done, it is the dead of night. The moon hangs high overhead. Dancing's given way to story swapping, something he can no longer hear from where he is. The Zulfirans listen as one of the Morans speaks. Fires paint his greenish skin gold, yet the look in his eyes is distant and pained. Thrun, they'd called him. He's asked after Malira every day since the end of the war. They will all be paying the price for their freedom for years to come, Teferi included. He has to go see the others. He gives the Mound of Dirt another reverent pat. Thank you for the company, he says. Next time, I'll bring the rest of our friends. Once he's gotten to his feet, it doesn't take long to reach his destination. He's in the healer's ward, and there is no dancing. There can't be. In all his days as a boy, the ward was never so full as this. Beds spill out into the surroundings. Boughs shaped to hold the infirm. Healers move from one to another like bees within a hive. Here, the wails of the dying provide a dirge to counter the joyous rhythm. Teferi doesn't look away from any of it. The results of this war have been a long time coming. If he ignores them now, he does a disservice to all those who made it a war they could win. As he searches for his friends, he takes the time to visit some of the injured and wish them well. Here and there, when he knows of something that might help, he assists the healers in their duties. Eventually, he makes his way into the main structure itself. Karn, Koth, and the others are easy to spot within it. They are sequestered away in their own section. Tonight, their new suns shine on them, but in the morning, the awning above will be dawn, and they will be in the cool shade. He wonders how Karn feels about that sort of thing, if it makes any difference to him either way. This isn't a fairy tale. You have to stop holding on. Ah, that voice. Kaya. She must have arrived while he was away. As he rounds the corner into their enclosure, he readies himself for the worst. There's a way. I just know there is. All we have to do is find it, right? And she's not getting any worse, so I don't see the harm. And if she awakens? The air in the room is taut as a bowstring when Teferi enters. All at once, he can feel their eyes on him. Karn, Koth, Chandra, and now Kaya. But there are others in the room, too. Nissa and Ajani are both laid out on their own beds. Chandra's got Nissa's hand in her own. She's not moved since they got back from New Phyrexia. 
Koth and Karn worked with the healers here to remove as much Phyrexian metal from her as they could, but from the look of it, she'd still have to hold on to some. A Johnny, next to her, is a newer sight. They haven't culled anything away from him yet. Aside from their breathing and the occasional twitching of their eyes, they are motionless. Between them, and with some help from Sahili during her brief visit, they think they understand why. Ren swapped New Phyrexia and Zulfir's places in the multiverse. That means New Phyrexia is off somewhere nothing can reach. Suppose you're New Phyrexia. You're going to complete thousands of people in short order. What's the best way to keep in contact with them? Sahili had asked them. Some kind of signal, answered Kaya. A call only they can hear. Sahili nodded. Just so. But what will you use to carry your signal? What unifies all Phyrexians? Oil, ventured Chandra. That's right. Maybe that's why they're so intent on spreading it. To amplify whatever signal they were spreading in the first place. Now that Phyrexia's left the multiverse, they've gone out of range. The oil keeps listening for new orders, but isn't receiving any. Why is that? Well, there are a host of possible answers, all worthy of study. However, in my expert opinion, I think all of it was tied back to Norn. A megalomaniac of that scale wouldn't want anyone else to have control over her army. I imagine she was the only one who could send orders. And further, that the oil is rendered inert without her. Wouldn't want a rival seizing control when you've lost contact, would you? So without her... They might have to sleep forever, said Koth. Or they might wake up, said Chandra, who sounded as if she was trying to convince herself first and foremost. The best thing to do is wait. That had been days ago. Sahili had long since left for Kaladesh anew. The rest of them? They'd continued to wait. Of course, not everyone is so lucky as to escape with their lives in suspended animation. Malir is here too. Teferi nods to her as he enters, but she hardly has the strength to acknowledge him. The healers have done what they can to hide the scent of rot, but there's no mistaking it. Her chest wound's gone bad. And judging from the clamminess of her skin and the glassy look in her eyes, she doesn't have long. Koth's at her side. Teferi feels a pang of anger at all of them, arguing over something that could wait when Malir is in this state. Thankfully, they stop when he came in. We can discuss that later, Kaya, he says. He picks up a small bowl and pours Malira fresh water. Then he hands it to Koth, who helps her to drink it. For tonight, let's be grateful we're all here in one piece. Right, says Kaya. Sorry. The war had us all on edge, says Koth. And I can't say you're wrong. We do have to decide what to do with them. But maybe, maybe not tonight. Do you have any good news? Chandra asks. How like her, quick to anger, but just as quick to forgive and forget. Some, Kaya says, things are starting to stabilize. Everywhere I've been, people are starting to catch their breath. Liliana's alright. So is Vivian. Tyvar's going to be bragging about killing a Phyrexian sea serpent long after we're all dead. Kaido's helping the Wanderer with her reconstruction efforts on Kamigawa. Still no sign of Jace or Vraska but I'm not holding my breath on either of those counts. Their conversation picks up from there. Chandra has about a thousand questions to ask, and only space for ten. Kaya's happy enough to answer whatever comes her way as a peace offering. But that's their conversation. Tidings of distant planes probably mean little to Malira, who spent all her life within the confines of New Phyrexia. Is there anything I can get you? He asks her. To his surprise, she offers a weak smile. You know, it's funny. I'm told I'm very funny, he answers. Koth's staring daggers at him for it, but Teferi knows how important laughter is to the sick, and she does chuckle a little. Sort of, in a certain kind of way, says Malira. I was hoping you'd come by. I have a request. Teferi takes her hand. Whatever I can do to help, just say the word. Malira turns her head, moving as slowly as a stuck weather vane. Her glassy eyes land on Karn. Could you call him over too? There's no need, 
Karn can hear them well enough, and he lumbers on over. It occurs to Teferi that they might be the most miserable people on Zulfir right now. A thick cloud of guilt stops up their throats and burns their eyes. All they can do is offer one another company. At least until Malira breaks the silence. Though spoken in a quiet voice, the words are bright and clear as lightning. I think... I think I have an idea for fixing the two of them. Koth frowns. They're gone, Malira. Not all the way. If their hearts are untouched, I might be able to manage something. The signal's dead, right? So as long as we can cleanse their bodies, they should be okay. In theory, Karn says. Teferi always admired how someone as large as his old friend could speak in hushed tones. Although the means of doing that have escaped us. That's just the thing, she says. We have the pieces right here. They've all come together. She pauses. Teferi's not sure whether it's because she's mulling over her proposition or because she's too tired to keep talking right now. Before he can offer her some peace to think things through, she continues. If we're going to do it, we have to do it soon. I don't have much longer. It isn't going to be easy, and there'll be a price. But I want people to have hope that it can happen. And maybe years from now someone will figure out an easier way to do it. One that won't require me or Karn. People need that hope. Teferi hangs his head. In the distance, he can hear the drums, announcing to all who will listen that Zulfir will welcome them. Rejoice, they say. Celebrate that you've survived. Not all of them have. Malira won't survive the night. But if they can save Nyssa and Ajani, maybe it's worth trying. Maybe they can erase just a little of this illness. Let's hear her plan, Teferi says. There you are. Do you have time to talk? Koth isn't used to Elspeth's celestial shape, but he has some faith that the woman underneath it is the same, yet only some. A woman standing atop a tree, balanced on a single foot, overlooking her surroundings in perfect stillness, can hardly be said to look human. Elspeth Terrell never looked at him with such clear eyes before. Koth, it is good to see you she says. Though she is atop the tree and he is at its base, he hears her perfectly. There is always time to talk, if talking is what's needed. Give me a moment. She lights down from the tree, floating like a feather down in front of him. As the drums continue, they head outward, toward a clear patch of grass. Koth can't remember the last time he saw so many plants in one place. Maybe never. Everything here feels so soft and delicate, as if it's under threat from his feet, but he tries not to dwell on it. This place is not Mirrodin. It can never be Mirrodin. The Mirrodin he fought for is as dead as Elish Norn. But that's part of what he wants to talk with Elspeth about. Once they're out of earshot, he takes a breath. Where to start? He could ask how she became... this... Thank her for coming back to a place like Mirrodin, knowing it could kill her. They could talk about what happened there in those final moments, or they could talk about what's going on in the healer's ward now. Normally he'd know exactly where to start, but here there's just too much. You want advice, Elspeth says. He feels a smile tugging at his lips. Didn't expect you to start things off. Yeah, I need advice. She doesn't smile back, although there's a certain softness to her features. This form has its blessings. What's troubling you? Do you know about Malira's plan? He asks. He isn't sure how far those new blessings extend. No, but I know that she will not be with us for much longer, she says. Elspeth looks up at the suns above them. I will be very sorry for her loss. Strange. The sorrow does touch her voice, but only slightly, and it never reaches her face. When he'd first met Elspeth, she cried often. To see her so composed now. Koth is proud, 
but part of him worries about her. When all of this is over, what will remain of those who fought for Mirrodin? Elspeth's an angel now, the Resistance survives bloodied and broken, Malira's about to die, and Karn. What will they even do with Malira afterward? She will be the first of them to die here. Among the Volshok, bodies were burned and ashes spread. But what were the traditions here? Would the Zulfirans want her buried beneath this soft earth, that the roots may claim her bones and the worms feast on her flesh? They might say it's an honor to rejoin nature, but Koth knows otherwise. Malira is from Mirrodin. They'll give her a proper send-off, when it comes to that. He presses his eyes closed. She wants to try and heal the others, Ajani and the elf. I owe Ajani my life, and much more besides, Elspeth says with a nod. It's going to kill her, doing that, Koth says. And Karn's going to burn what he's got left of Venser's spark, too. They have it all planned out. He doesn't care to argue about whether Ajani deserves redemption. Phyrexia warps those it touches. But there's a bitterness in his heart when he considers that Ajani might make it out of this with time to consider his actions. So many Morans won't have the same opportunity. And no one fought to bring the bodies of their completed brethren back only the bodies of the dead. Why is it that Ajani and Nyssa are being given a second chance at life when so many of his companions aren't? It's a difficult thing to swallow. More so when the Zulfirans have been nothing but kind to them. Fresh cooked meals every night, new colorful homes for each of them, and plenty of visits to stave off the silence, new clothes and new friends. Hard to ask for anything more than this. Mirrodin is dead, but Morans can live on, thanks to Zulfir and her people. He is grateful to them, more grateful than he can hold in his mind at any moment. But do Ajani and Nyssa deserve that same mercy? Elspeth's brows inch closer to each other. Hmm, how is it meant to work? That she doesn't ask about Malira or Karn upsets him. He can't quite keep his tone level when he answers. First, she's going to inoculate their bodies against further infection. That's standard. But then Karn's going to pull their sparks out, and use Venser's sparks to... filter them, somehow. Some theory Venser had before everything happened. When he brings them back, Malira will clean the sparks, and then Karn will place them back inside. The whole thing sounds risky. More so when Elspeth doesn't immediately respond. Silence only leaves him to contemplate all the ways in which things can go wrong. He runs a hand over the back of his head, the rough metal a welcome anchor to reality. Everything else here was too soft, too plush, even the fabric of the clothing they'd lent him. People here were kind, valiant, and attentive, but they'd never know suffering the way he did. May this roughness always remind him of that. You're afraid, Elspeth says. Part of him wants to argue the point, a large part, bellowing within his chest, but he knows she's right. Aren't you? She looks up at the suns again. No. She's going to die. In a manner of her own choosing, Elspeth answers. Once, you said to me you'd fight for Mirrodin even if there was no Mirrodin left. You stayed knowing you might die, and leaving me no choice in the matter. You were my friend, and I left Mirrodin, thinking you'd been torn apart by Phyrexians. For years that thought pained me. Koth looks down. I no longer feel that pain, but the lesson lingered. We all choose how to face our end, and some causes are worth the price of a life. Malira is willing to pay that price on behalf of others. There's a valor in that. She says. Elspeth lays her hand on his shoulders. She is making this choice herself, and for the benefit of others. She'll be among friends. But what do we do afterward? Koth says. At last, it feels like he's come to the truth of it. What are we going to do here? Elspeth remains serene, but she does offer him a smile. You will try to make this place home. It will welcome you if you let it. I'm not sure I know how anymore, 
he says, and I don't think it's that simple. Many things aren't, but that doesn't mean they're not worth trying. She draws him into an embrace, and he finds himself slumping against her, trying to make sense of the cacophony in his head. Elspeth could be difficult sometimes, but this is something new entirely. He's not sure how much she's listening to him. This place isn't his home. His home is gone, forever, and she's just... He hates how much the embrace helps. Words don't mean much, but at least she knows when someone needs holding. You've... you've changed, haven't you? He mumbles. Yes, comes the simple answer. But I will always be your friend, Koth. If you ever have need of me, all you have to do is pray. He feels her squeezing tighter, and hears the flap of her wings. She's taking him somewhere. The irony hits him like a hammer to the chest. Years ago, he'd sunk her into the ground to send her someplace else. He didn't want her to have a choice. Tonight, she lifts him through the air to make his choice for him. The wind whips against his skin. This isn't goodbye. No, not with me, she says. But you do owe someone a goodbye. His feet touch the ground again. She's left him out in front of the healer's ward. The earth brings with it the weight of what will soon happen. This isn't his earth. The earth here is soft and springy, yielding too readily to him. Nothing here is metal save the things the Zulfirans have made themselves. And even then, they favor bone and glass where the Volshok would use steel. Nothing about this place is home. He doesn't see how it could be. Maybe Elspeth can, from her vaunted place. But here on the ground? Thank you, he calls to Elspeth. As much as his mind was still an avalanche, she'd at least tried to help. Always, she says. Always. So easy for her to say. She might be immortal now. She has all of eternity to make herself feel at home. But him? Koth crosses his arms. He watches Elspeth take off beneath Mirrodin's suns. He watches the suns, too, as they move across a new firmament. Sahili, the scientist, said it was probably an unintended consequence of the planes overlapping. An unintended consequence, just like him and the other Morans. He takes a breath. This won't be easy, but so long as those suns are in the sky, he can face it. This place isn't home, but there's a little of home in it. Let's do this outside. I want, I want to be outside when it happens. In the face of everything they're about to do, Malira's request is simple. Teferi and the others promise to honor it. Outside they go. Teferi, Karn, Koth, Chandra, Kaya, and Malira. The nights here are warmer than the days on some other planes, but it is not an unpleasant sort of warmth. No, as they step out into the swaying grass, each feels curiously as if they're stepping into someone's home. The first order of business is to spread out the blankets for Nyssa and Ajani to lay on. Next comes setting them down. The sunlight lends their Phyrexian implants a gilded luster. You're sure this is going to work? Kaya asks. We won't know until we try, says Chandra clearing away strands of hair from Nissa's face. And it's worth it to try. Silence, then, that Teferi worries will become another argument. In the end, Kaya nods. Right, well, I'll help where I can. He's grateful she doesn't illuminate all the ways this could go wrong. There are many, and there are many things left to do. For this to work, they must all work in harmony, just as the drums of different communities come together. His job is, in some senses, the easiest, and he will lose the least through this process. Part of him almost resents that. No, that's a young man's thinking, and selfish besides. He will make good by doing good. Right now, doing good means forming a small time bubble around them. It won't last long. Looking over the others, he asks if they are ready. Koth lays Malira down between Ajani and Nyssa. With her eyes closed, she nods. 
Karn takes his place standing over everyone's heads. His shoulders rise and fall with unnecessary breath. It is hard not to smile at it a little, at him taking on such human traits. But this is not a time for smiling. Karn will lose almost as much as Malira in this. If he is nervous, it is only natural. I'm willing to try. Alright, says Teferi. I won't be able to keep this up for long. He breathes in. The soft vibration of the drums fills his lungs as surely as the air. Magic hums within him. His body aches still from the war's exertions, but he will not falter when his friends need him. Not anymore. All at once, the air distorts around them. The whipping grass slows to a near standstill. Beyond the unseen sphere of power, the outside world continues. But here, they have only the space between two beats of a drum to save their friends. Karn acts first, driving his hand into the metal portions of their bodies. He pulls something out, something shimmering and bright. Teferi's ears ring as Karn's magic builds within him, an engine gathering steam. Or is this hesitation? What he is about to do will change him forever. In some ways, he's saying goodbye to an old friend to save two new ones. No wonder there's so much angst to him. Teferi strains against the waves of time. Karn will make the right choice here, he knows it. Light leaks from within the silver golem's plates, light as pale and glistening as the moon's. Karn closes his eyes. Together, Venser, he says, quiet in a way only he can be. A thundering boom threatens to throw off Teferi's concentration, but he holds fast. It passes, and the two orbs Karn had been holding are gone. Malira takes the hands of her companions. She, too, begins to glow. A glow which spreads through Nyssa and Ajani. Her face wretches in concentration. First, the Leonin. Every second that cannot pass is a hook in Teferi's soul. He grunts as he strains to keep time. He grunts as he strains to keep time stopped long enough for Malira to finish her work. As he watches, the glow ripples through Ajani. Wherever it goes, it leaves their skin brighter and removes the sinister luster Phyrexia has impressed upon them. The metal that remains is nearly as pure as moon silver, but this is only half the work. Another boom sees the two orbs returning to Karn's hands, one whole and pure, one crumbling. As Malira turns her attention to Nissa's orb, Teferi's heart sinks. It's flickering. Worse than that are the ash-like motes of energy falling away from it. Teferi is used to seeing things happen in slow motion. This is like watching a leaf decay right before his eyes. Lattice holes open as the light courses through it. I can't slow that down, Teferi shouts. Quickly, says Malira. Kaya helps her up so that she can reach the orbs. A single touch and a halo of light ripples out of them. It's almost time. Almost. Violet wreathes Kaya. She too drives her hands into the spheres of light. Together with Karn, they send them back to their respective hosts. Teferi drops his spell, and drops to his knees. Sweat slicks his brow. The drums return, carrying with them news he is too tired to follow. All he can do now is turn his attention to the others and hope that what they've done is worth the sacrifices they've made. His answer comes when a Johnny's good eye flutters open, when breath returns to his scarred chest. Despite his injuries, he forces himself to sit up. What? What? Where am I? Zalfir, says Kaya. Zalfir, that's impossible, he says. But the more he looks around, the more he seems to realize it's the truth. But so too does the tiredness overtake him. He slumps back over to the ground. The fairy, I'll congratulate you some other time. I think my body needs rest. He's asleep before Teferi can say much else, and for the better. 
let him have a few moments of peace before the horror of what he did dawns on him. Karn slumps over, one hand to his great chest. The lights within him have dimmed, only the ghost of them remains, an afterimage in red and violet. Are you alright? Teferi calls. It's... it's... I feel lonelier, Karn says. I will miss him, but I'll be alright. Koth is less sure. He kneels next to Malira and pulls her onto his lap. She fell as fast as Teferi did. The concern on his brow is easy to read, as is the misery that compels him to close his eyes. She's gone. Kaya lays a hand on his shoulder. Tears run down his cheeks, yet Koth does not conceal them or hide how much pain he's in. Teferi knows exactly the kind of pain that's driving him now. It isn't just Malira's death, it's everyone's, felt at the same time. All his friends, comrades, almost everyone he's ever known, gone. Teferi pushes himself up. He and Karn both throw an arm around Koth as the tears take over. There aren't words enough at times like these. Their only consolation is that Malira's wound no longer troubles her, that she must no longer live in fear. But to say this would be cold comfort to Koth, so Teferi bites his tongue. Companionship will have to do. Grief is an awful burden to bear alone. Yet the air is thick with grief. Next to them, Chandra shakes Nyssa, anxiety flaring hotter with every second. What happened? Why isn't she awake yet? The flickering... Something went wrong, Teferi says. He swallows. I'm not sure if she's... Maybe it had been too much to hope for. Returning someone from Phyresis, even Urza hadn't figured that one out. Who were they to try? Having no other options didn't mean they succeeded. You could dedicate your whole life to a craft and never get any acclaim for it. You could spend every waking minute laboring to further a cause and never see it come to fruition. Wanting something so badly it threatens to break you does not mean that you are entitled to it. But sometimes... Chandra? Sometimes, it'll be worth it. It's worth it to be alive here on Zulfir. It's worth it to be surrounded by friends and older community, families old and new. It's worth it to put the past, at last, behind him. To build a new future. And it's worth it to see that happen for others. To see the tension on Chandra's face melt to pure happiness. To see her clutch Nissa close, and to see Nissa hold her in turn. To hear the happy sobs along with the despairing ones. This is life. This is what they all fought for. What Malira died for, and why Karn's given up his spark. Why Teferi's spent hundreds of years trying to restore his home. For this. I'm right here, Chandra says. She presses her lips to Nissa's. I'm right here, and I'm not going anywhere. Good, Teferi thinks. He won't be going anywhere for a while, either. Thank you for watching the video, and an extra big thank you to the Patreon patrons and YouTube members that help make these videos possible. Hope you have a wonderful day. Bye bye